coordinator and general wunderkind of the Vintagers History Draft. I'm just verifying that we're going live right now, seeing things popping up. Yes, looks great. Excellent. And make sure it's working for an external spot. Um. Doo -doo -doo. Okay, yeah, here, we're good. Excellent. So let's get started. Um, mostly I helped out with the VRD just because I'm married to Mark and I wanted things to go well in my house. Um, we tend to have a lot of different events here, so we've had a lot of preparation for doing something like this. Um, so, but the Vintage Art History Draft in particular had a couple of extra considerations that you'd want to do if you wanted to host one yourself. So, basically, if you had, you know, eight friends and you wanted to do a Art History Draft like this, um, here's some things that you want to keep in mind. So, the first thing that um, you kind of saw Mark do was he had a Google spreadsheet for everyone to pick their draft picks. In order to do that, you need a couple of things. First of all, you need everyone to kind of be at the same place at the same time, kind of like a fantasy football draft. You want a big table or big living room or something like that, and you want to, you know, have everyone sit together. Um, we had a big table with eight chairs, and we told everyone to bring a laptop. Um, almost everyone brought a laptop. A couple people brought their phones. The first draft, somebody used their phone to actually draft everything on the spreadsheet. That was pretty intense. Right? I mean, I can't imagine scrolling through back and forth on a tiny little screen. Um, just the nature of being both software developers, we had a couple of spare laptops. So um, luckily, this time around, everyone got to use a laptop to actually look through things. So uh, definitely tell everyone to bring a laptop. But if you can, have a spare laptop or two. Um, so let's actually pull up what our dining room table is so people can get a picture of what we're talking about there. We actually had, here's some pictures from Twitter about it. Um, this is the one of the two tables we had out for people to actually play on. This is, uh, there's four players here sitting in our front room, but then we also had players sitting, um, sitting at the main table here drafting. Uh, let's see if we can get the picture of draft itself. I don't know if that one's up here or not. Um, Should be. There we go. go. Yeah. yeah, so we had everyone kind of crowded around this uh, this table that looks very small, but I assure you is <laughs> decently large when it doesn't have things all over it. Um, and you can kind of see in this picture that at the very end of the table, we set it up so you could stream uh, one of the feature matches. Um, what we found was we spent a lot of time the day before trying to set this up. Uh, we had two play mats out and then kept doing uh, practice streams to see if you could see the majority of a card. We had to play around with lighting. That's why you see a couple of lamps in there. Um, and basically, once that was set up, we tried not to touch it that much. In the future, I think we'd probably try to do a little bit better lighting. Uh, yeah. You could see that some of the cards were kind of fuzzy on the stream, um, but everyone impressively knows the cards way better than I did and could tell just based on picture what things were. Um, if you do want to follow along, here's a link to the Twitter. Go ahead and uh, you can follow on Twitter and see all the pictures that we're talking about right there. Yeah, so the other thing that we kind of started with uh, just the morning before was I actually dropped the air conditioner a whole bunch. Uh, <laughs> maybe like... Nothing like sweaty nerds that need more AC, right? <laughs> it was like two to three degrees Celsius, so what, 10 degrees Fahrenheit-ish? I don't know, whatever. Sure. <laughs> Doesn't matter what the... Uh, conversion is you really just want to drop the temperature low enough because you have eight laptops that are all crowded around a table and people sitting in very close proximity being really really excited about this draft so um, it will heat up really fast especially with the extra lamps in the area so we drop the temperature really early um, Talking about having all the laptops, the other thing that we kind of in the middle set up was a lot of extension cords because in the middle of the draft, everyone's laptop battery started dying. Yep. Um, and you wanted to make sure that the extension cords weren't tripping hazards too. So try to have a power strip available as Painter's well. Painter's tape comes in really handy there. One, just one or two inch painter's tape 
can uh, really easily stripe down all your cords and have people not trip over them when they've had a few drinks and also uh, be just really easy to clean up at the end. And that's a great segue into the preparation I kind of did before. Um, I went to the grocery store and got a lot of different caffeinated and uncaffeinated drinks. Um, we started the draft at 10 a.m. Most people brought coffee along with them, but during the day, it's what, seven matches against each other yeah. after like a two to three hour draft beforehand. Um, so people's energy start to run really low so you want to make sure that you have a lot of well water available but caffeinated drinks uncaffeinated drinks um alcohol in this instance we had a lot of budweiser and uh spotted cow you gotta um, represent for st louis yeah. uh and we had disposable cups and disposable plates just because it made it a lot easier to generally clean up um we ordered lunch in Mark can show the picture of the crazy, oh, yeah. crazy pizza that uh, he ordered ahead of time. So we are not sponsored by Pointer's Pizza, but I am a big fan of this 28-inch monster that doesn't really fit through our doorway. They have to turn it at an angle. Um, we actually put it on stream for a little while, but it is it, it is massive. Um, they, the delivery guy brought it in for us, which was very nice of him. But you can see it here in our kitchen. It's just it's as tall as a person. It's probably roughly your height. Oh, funny. Um yeah, no, it, it, I think it is actually, it is definitely taller than Logan, though, than our kid. Yeah, so. Um, so we ordered just a cheese pizza. One of the things that we didn't quite consider was uh, different people have different dietary restrictions, mm -hmm. and one of the delays that we had on stream was somebody ran out to get different food. So I would probably in the future tell participants that, hey, this is the pizza that we're ordering. Uh, if you have dietary restrictions, bring something for lunch because we're going to want to get started after a certain amount of lunch break. Um, and kind of in going with that, prepare your participants for um, if they need to leave, kind of have ground rules around. If you need to leave or if there's a delay in your matches for some reason, um, you need to figure that out. Like, okay, you went and took a phone call. That's fine. You left for an hour and you're – you only played one game and everyone else is on their sixth game. You need to kind of figure out that balance. Yep. Um, With that in mind, we also made sure that everyone, uh, we started the actual stream at 10. We start, had everyone arrive at 9.30. In hindsight, I think that would have actually been, um, it, it was a little problematic. I think if we had had more commentators. So the issue is we had two commentators and no logistics people. So Neem luckily filled in for us and helped out. Uh, but in hindsight, I think that if we could have a third commentator or a dedicated logistics person, it'd be far better to have the commentary start about half an hour early. So actually have commentary start around 9.30. Because that way you can get answers to a lot of the questions. The first, when people came in and into chat, 90% of the time somebody would be like, what is this thing you're doing? What is a vintage rotisserie draft? It's just not a format people see all the time. So getting, first of all, familiarity with the format and describing what it is that's about to happen, as well as familiarity with the players. So people, there can be storylines that start emerging. It'd be really helpful. Uh, because we didn't really have any of that, and it was basically like, all right, we're starting to stream. Here's the first three picks before we even introduce ourselves. Um, so having some kind of setup for that would be significantly easier, and that just involves players getting there earlier, but also having more than just the people who are commentating, but somebody else that can brief the players and kind of do the player meeting. We had, I think, 10 levels of judge between the set, between the eight participants. Oh, wow. So uh, there, there were people that were very familiar with terminal logistics, but you still want to, like, walk through – Here's where bathrooms are in the house. Here's the rules of the tournament. Here's what to do when something goes wrong. Uh, here's the rough schedule that's going to happen. Um, make sure everyone has their buy-ins. In our case, the buy-ins were, uh, let's see if we can find them here. The buy-ins were these delicious bottles of liquor. But you want to make sure that all of that stuff's organized beforehand. Because even with telling Magic players to arrive at 9.30, 9.55 was roughly when the last one arrived. So it was obviously like, if we say we're yeah. going to start streaming at 10, we're going to start streaming at 10. And that can be difficult if we don't uh, if we don't have that all prepped up. So, uh, one of the other things with the spreadsheet was Mark invited everyone to the spreadsheet ahead of time, yep. and then some people were thought they were locked out uh, for whatever reason. Um, some people logged in with different Gmail accounts or different other accounts, and so. You just have to kind of make sure that everyone... Um, Do you see who's that there in chat? Hi, Rob. Yeah, how you doing, and Rob? Julie. <laughs> I presume Julie as well. Yes. 
Um, and so you just want to make sure that everyone's actually on the right spreadsheet because that was hard. Some people were trying to fill in other players' picks, and it just gets to be a little bit clumsy. Absolutely. I'm going to see if we can pull up a picture of the spreadsheet. Um, because it's in case you have in case you're not uh, super familiar with uh, what a vintage history draft is, uh, these are it sounds very tame. Um, we see people sitting around computers, but in the end, they are looking through every card in Magic's history and deciding whether they want to play that card. Um, so it's it's very it's a little overwhelming when you first see it, but there's just like a lot of picks that all have a ton of context for people, and aren't necessarily uh, very accessible if you're a random viewer that doesn't know magic incredibly well. So, yeah, you can see there kind of the, the size of the, the, the scope of what people are trying to accomplish. Yeah, I definitely thought it was pretty intense. I do like at the very end of the spreadsheet, there's a column that kind of shows you how the snake drafting works. Um, so you could kind of see at the very end which direction you go in yep. afterwards. We also had uh, we also had points in time where so after pick twenty after round twenty we would have a break, um, which was really nice because we get commentary we got players to be able to go grab more drinks uh, have some breakfast uh, and get some interviews going as well so we kind of got more of that break period and after that point there was a lot of interesting picks that changed up from it so I think next time what we're going to do is basically have two breaks one after round fifteen and one after round thirty. Uh, and in those breaks, you kind of just write in the spreadsheet where the next pick would be after the break and say stop. So I mean, nobody, uh, nobody just launches forward and keeps going. So one of the big things, biggest points of preparation for this by far was that Mark printed out proxy cards for what he thought would be the core set of vintage cards, right? Um, and we spent hours and hours and hours with paper cutters cutting these cards out day after day after day. Um, so you could do it in two ways. You could do that way where people can look to see if their most likely picks are in these little buckets of cards and then decide to sleeve them. Or you could actually go to uh, the website that puts all the proxy cards. mtgpress.net is the site that I used. There's lots of them that do the same thing. Um, that was just the one that was the cleanest for me. Yeah, and um, so what ended up happening where most people looked through the cards, got the ones that they wanted, and then compiled a list of all the cards that they still needed to print. Um, and then we kind of had to run really quickly and get things printed and then have a lot of paper cutters and scissors involved um, so people can actually cut out their cards. And that just kind of added to the preparation time of how long it takes you to actually build your deck. Um, so I would keep on hand a lot of scissors, a lot of paper cutters, extra printer ink. That was a last minute buy. That was very useful. And then making sure that when you are printing, uh, you're not printing double-sided because there were far too many pages that we accidentally printed double-sided in full color that we had to throw away yep. um, or just reprint. Um, so kind of keep that in mind um, and have a separate laptop available for people to put their cards in really fast to actually be able to print it out. Um, and yeah, so that's probably the longest amount of time. If you didn't want to print out cards ahead of time, you would then get every single person to dump their list of picks into that website and then print out the cards, cut their own cards themselves. Or just have a dedicated logistics person that is sitting there and is aware of what cards are already printed or not and is printing out the extras on the fly kind of on demand as people are picking them, which is what we're going to do for the next time. So oh, hopefully nice. we can reduce that. Yeah, I like that a lot. You, uh, you can see in these um, yellow buckets, there's uh, stacks of cards. Just each of these is completely full there's I think we have I don't know there are literally thousands at this point of cards printed off so we have a pretty good backlog catalog but even with that there were multiple people that had more than 20 picks that needed to be printed so it's definitely it's definitely a much needed change so and um, since Mark didn't actually play in the draft uh, he asked people to send him ahead of time certain cards that they thought they were gonna draft from the newest sets so we could print them out ahead of time too and that actually helped because we had probably 20 30 cards that we printed the night before and we cut out um, when so all the players, so we had eight different colors of sleeves available and then a ton of different lands. So everyone took their proxy card, put it over a land, and then put it in a sleeve. Um, and that was very helpful just, you know, logistically for everyone to have the same thickness and 
um, kind of keep things nicely instead of having, you know, an actual land be thicker than the proxy paper. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, that, that's, is that kind of all the stuff you had to do beforehand or is there anything else that um, we wanted to do before? Yeah, that's mostly the stuff that we had to do before. Um, and that was really the bulk of just trying to make sure that you had everything. Um, there were some logistics that we had to kind of do on the fly on the day of. Mm -hmm. So we can kind of go over that. Um, at Does anyone have any questions about the pre prep there? I, uh, I know that, uh, Rob, you're probably not likely to be starting one of these uh, <laughs> right in Ann Arbor right now. But um, it is definitely like it's a fun experience to kind of get the seat, to get the view behind and talk to a logistics coordinator about how all this stuff works. They might do a draft of Star Realms. That's true, actually, yeah. Doing yeah. a live Star Realms tournament on Twitch would be amazing. Yeah. Julie, you got to get on that. I would love to see that. Um, Mark and Mark can play in that, yes. I would love to. <laughs> um, okay, but then, so uh, one of the other things we did beforehand, which isn't strictly necessary by any means, was creating a bot that would let us do things like uh, type standings, um, and it would give you, it would output the record, so anyone in chat could just be able to see and interact with this bot. Um, all the code's up on GitHub under, if you just search ninth seed on GitHub, you'll find it. Um, but it had, you can see down in the description below us right now, what all the commands are for the bot that you could, for instance, players could vote on what they wanted, um, if they, who they wanted to come on commentary next and things like that. So that would be that was an interesting, um, a fun little exercise, and relatively easy to interact with the Twitch. Nice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so what kind of things popped up the day of? I think we might have <laughs> we're gonna have a baby on stream in a second here because Logan is getting very excited. Um. So day of, uh, somebody brought a roll of toilet paper as. Kleenex, um, and so we, yeah. I can't get behind that one. I know. So I actually brought out a couple of boxes of Kleenex. Um, we also needed to bring out a lot of napkins, too, because obviously everyone had cards and had pizza hands, and uh, we didn't need that on uh, the sleeves. Um, and I might be a little bit prissy. Uh, we also had a, a yeah, just a little. Um, we had mid-round snacks, um, so probably around... When everyone was like three-ish games in, I felt like it was a good time to have a snack. Um, I put out some fruit and a whole, and like two huge bags of pizza rolls um, that went pretty fast. So you kind of have to pick a snack that's not super messy um, so that people can still play and eat at the same time, basically. Um, we did have pizza and then pizza rolls, which probably wasn't the best in terms of variety. That whole dietary restrictions thing definitely came up there as well. Yeah, um, I also handed out uh, individual sized uh, bags of chips, which was also pretty helpful. Um, again, a lot more napkins would probably be useful. Um, at the beginning of the tournament itself, Mark went over the rules. Um, the first rule that he kind of went over was don't be a dick. Pretty self-explanatory. Um, he was kind of going over, um, and I think some of the more rules that we'd probably add is having, if you are leaving the house or the play area for an extended amount of time, you need to like recognize that you might forfeit a match or mm. something like that. I think this all falls under the, the don't be a dick rule. Right, exactly. Um, and just kind of keeping that in mind. Um, again, phone call, totally fine, but sometimes people were popping in and out, and that just made it a little bit harder to kind of find the next person um, to keep track of. Yep. Um, one of the interesting things I don't think anyone kind of realized was everyone knew that there was a Twitch stream and they were super curious what Mark and Brandon were commentating about their draft picks. Huh. And so after the 20th round, um, people hopped on to chat to see what was happening. They didn't, uh, I think one person tried to like watch a little bit of it, but you have to decide ahead of time, like, do you want your people to be untainted by all commentary? Or do you want them to be able to go on break and actually see what the Twitch stream is saying and maybe sway their decisions in any way? I don't know, Mark. Yeah, so this is one of those things where uh, we definitely have a rule that you're not allowed to do that um, because we <laughs> want chat to be able to talk freely about what uh, what's allowed and what's not allowed. And we want 
we, we want to be able to say like, oh, this pick's gone forgotten for 20 rounds. And if somebody can just yeah. go in a chat and see that, all of a sudden now it becomes, it, it's no longer forgotten and you lose a lot of the drama of what's happening. Um, so yeah, but you certainly could have a possibility where people could watch. Uh, in this case, go watch the VODs. It's available via our YouTube link. So let me just link YouTube here, if Logan will let me. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you can find all of the old the old video if you re really want to rewatch this whole thing on our YouTube channel, and players can do that as well. So it's not like they're going to miss out on it forever. They're going to be on commentary themselves. Um, it's nothing nothing special. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I thought that was kind of interesting. I know that some people in between, like, okay, I pick something, they would just hop over and look at chat mm -hmm. in between, so not even at the 20th round. So I think just deciding ahead of time and briefing people on the rules would probably be pretty helpful on that. For sure. And this is just players that aren't super familiar with playing on streamed things, right? Like, in a Magic tournament, there's no way that you would ever uh, be allowed to play while watching a stream. And the same thing is true here. We just had to, we should, probably should have gone over that, so. Yeah. Um, so the morning before, we actually had a player drop um, around, what, 3 a.m.? It was 3 a.m. We got a text message yeah. saying I can't be there. Um, luckily, we had, who was it, Coins? Yeah, John Coins stepped yeah, in, Yeah, John Coins awesome stepped in. Um, super amazing. So I would also keep a backup list of players that you could reach out to things happen, right? Um, and so you just want to have somebody on call. Maybe they could be an extra logistics person or an extra commentator that could easily flip into the role of playing in the draft too. Mm -hmm. um, Mark was thinking that maybe if he couldn't find someone, he would have to play. Thank goodness that didn't happen. Thank you, Coins. I can't even imagine trying to stream uh, and play or like leave Brandon in the booth by himself. Trying to do it just talking oh into a God. camera by yourself is awful. Especially for, what, 10 hours? Like, no. Yeah, it would be terrible. And and we do have a kind of an interesting system here where one player is always in the booth with the commentator, but not having a break for 10 hours would be really tough. So. Yeah, completely agreed. Um, inside the booth, we had a couple of things going. Um, we had a lot of water available for the people inside the booth. Um, yes, water. Water was the primary thing was being drunk. So. <laughs> um, and uh, and there's a large setup of, you know, an extra monitor, a streaming camera, a laptop, keyboards for people. Um, I think I would probably in the future maybe tell people how to stream a little bit so like hey you're gonna come in you're gonna go in for an interview let's make sure that the mic is working because at some point uh one of the settings of the mic kind of got bumped and people could kind of hear that difference um yep. and that's why we have now have two uh microphones that are relatively difficult to break um so hopefully the sound sounds decent before we got a weird echo effect honestly like our microphones were just too expensive <laughs> as odd as that sounds uh we were borrowing microphones and they were too high quality for what we knew how to deal with so yep. they had lots of cool things where you could balance them against each other and prevent reverb but really it just made us screw ourselves over so. <laughs> yeah. um i would brief the players on so mark knew all of the uh, bot commands and sometimes other players would come in and try to do something like that or you know control the stream or anything like that so if you are having somebody in there have one person who knows all the twitch stuff fair and then another person who doesn't deal with it or doesn't really touch it at all and that'll be even more important next time because we're going to have things like Twitch Drive's advantage bar and like voting for pretty much every part of the stream that you can imagine. So there will be some pretty neat stuff. But yeah, we'll, we'll have everything down in the description below, but nobody reads that, especially if they're on mobile. <laughs> so it's important to have an understanding from whoever is in there. Yes, Logan, this is a, this is a cord. This is how you strangle yourself. It's really bad. Don't do that. Don't let him strangle himself. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, uh... So, um, lastly, we uh, had our Wi-Fi info posted, like, everywhere so that people could easily get on with the laptop they were using for the stream and also for their phones. Um, that was just something that w became minorly annoying as we were streaming inside here and people needed to find Mark for the Wi-Fi information. Um, it's like relatively small things that you don't want people to be bothering the person on stream for. So figuring out and kind of telling your players like, yes, come in the booth and bother me for X, Y, and Z. Don't come in the booth and bother me because you want to find something random in my house that isn't related to this draft. Yeah. 
right? Um, I think that just makes things a little bit more seamless and a little less uh, stressful for the person who's, you know, talking to you guys. Um, yeah. But Our child breathes very loudly, by the way. <laughs> Uh, otherwise, I think that was mostly it for the preparation around things. Um, luckily, we didn't have any, what I would call, like, stranglers of random people who were kind of there to just watch and maybe distract people. You said stragglers, not stranglers, Stra right? Stragglers. Yeah. It was a cord that made me think of stranglers. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No one's strangling our child. We're good. Um, and... I think uh, you need to determine if you want to limit that or not. Um, on the one hand, it's kind of nice because when people are in between games, they have someone to talk to. That's not me trying to take care of a baby. Um, on the other hand, uh, it's an extra level of distraction, um, especially while people are playing the game. I know I like to bother people while they're playing the game and make them lose focus. So you have to decide if that's something you want or don't want. Yep. Um. But yeah, other than that, I think that that's pretty much everything. I mean, there's a lot of other preparation that happened for this format in particular, but I think for streaming in general, um, one thing we didn't talk about is the, the cameras and kind of the logistical setup. Oh, yeah. So let's jump back over and take out check a look what, uh, what that would look like. Um, here you have a picture of um, the actual like play area, but what kind of a setup was there going on? You can see there's a camera up here. So talk through kind of the, the difficulties that we went through in <laughs> yeah. building this streaming setup? Uh, it was a very difficult streaming setup. So first of all, we bought a streaming camera at the very last minute on Amazon. Pretty relatively, um, well, it was less expensive than I thought it would be. Um, we had a friend, Xavier, who came over the day before and he actually brought over a microphone stand that you could kind of see here. And we attached it to a small table um, and then we put the camera at the top of the microphone stand. So that allowed it so that the camera itself could look down on top of the um, play field. And you there's a link to Xavier's stream there as well. He's pretty great. Um, so you could actually see kind of this setup um, allowed us to look down on the play field itself. You could decide if that's what you want or if you want to see more of the players' faces or what. Um, this was probably the most useful for us. We did spend a lot of time kind of adjusting the camera so it was showed just enough. Uh, each of the corners of the play mat was kind of where we wanted our boundaries to be. And then uh, we also had a lot of lighting issues. So without any of the lamps, uh, all you could see was just glare on all of the cards from the sleeves. So when you're testing this, you want to have sleeved cards because that's where the biggest amount of glare came from. Uh, we tried a lot of things. We don't have to go through all of them, but probably the worst thing that we tried was putting a trash bag over our chandelier lighting and... Didn't help at all. No. Um, and so, and we tried a weird setup of like cardboard to shield the light. Uh, what we found was adding a lot more light helped take away some of the glare, but still didn't take away enough of the glare. So that's something that we're going to kind of iterate in the next couple of months and try to see if we could tighten up before we do it again. Definitely. Anything else you wanted to hit before we call it a day? Um, I don't think so. Um, luckily, we had eight great players who yep. all got along, um, all mostly knew each other or introduced themselves to other people. Um, there was friendly ribbing um, on the <laughs> streaming side, so I got to see or sorry, on the drafting side, I got to see both sides. So, uh, so it was kind of great seeing the side of people, um, kind of gently teasing each other if they, uh, had the same draft pick, um, and didn't realize it. Or, uh, there was a lot of like ooing and eyeing over somebody picking a card that people didn't realize. Yeah, there was a, there was really intense banter, I would say. <laughs> yeah. uh, there was I a lot of making fun. I think that was probably the best part. Um, that, so Julie apparently yeah. wants to know, how did you adjudicate match disputes? Oh, I didn't do any of that. Yeah, so uh, it w like I said, we had 10 levels of judges. Um, so we had a lot of pretty experienced people with the rules. Um, but still, there were definitely things that came up. We actually had one pretty high profile one that happened on stream where somebody realized that they had two copies of a card in their deck and they're not supposed to. And it, players basically like worked through it themselves, came up with a proposed solution. Um, but 
once again, we were playing this not at a competitive rules enforcement level where there's actually rules for how to handle these things. Like in that scenario, it would be um, it, it would it would be potentially a game loss for the player. In this case, we're playing at don't be a dick. Everyone's kind of assuming that they're not. Everyone knows each other and knows that no one is trying to cheat because like that's would defeat the entire purpose of this event, which is supposed to be to have fun. Um, so we we kind of handled it via. A trusting all the players and working things out. In that scenario, we just pulled the card out and moved on with the match. But yeah, it's definitely kind of what level of competitiveness. At this level of competitiveness, we were drinking a lot of Budweiser and mimosas, so it wasn't as important to get the rules precisely as right to prevent cheating. In our case, it was way more about getting the game moving forward and making sure everyone's having a good time. So, yeah. Yeah. Um... In the future, I don't think anyone in particular had a really slow, slow, slow deck. No. Um, but that might be something that you want to consider. Um, what you want to do rules around. Because I know in more competitive formats, uh, there's times. Yeah, there's definitely yeah. time limits on things. In our case, uh, it wasn't it wasn't an issue. Yep. Um, because, once again, we didn't have a time limit on the event. We knew we were going to go from 10 a.m. to 11 p.m., and we did, and it was kind of just goes with the territory. So, but yeah, if you did want to run an event and call time, that's that's definitely within your prerogative. It's just a thing that you kind of have to decide beforehand, so nobody gets surprised that they find out they only have five minutes left. Yep. All right. Well, I think this little guy is ready to call it for the day. <laughs> as he was at the draft as True. well. <laughs> yeah, he was very excited at the draft, uh, and very excited about all the people that were there. Yep. So. Cool. Well, thanks for watching. Yeah, thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, but yeah, we'll probably have one or two more of these and then call it until the next draft. There's actually a possibility that um, on this channel we'll be streaming a Christmas in July cube that my fr that uh, friend uh, Kevin Freeman runs here in St. Louis. So we'll be posting more updates about that on the Twitter, so feel free to follow along there. Um, otherwise, everything we post here also gets reposted to YouTube, so feel free to follow along there. All the links are down below. But yeah, follow, hit the follow button up here. Um, that's the best way you can help us out right now. But um, in the future, we're going to have lots of uh, emotes and things like that that can pop in as well. So we'll be posting all the updates via Twitter. But thanks bye. for all for tuning in. Bye. Say bye, Logan. Bye. Scream bye, Logan. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thanks.